Hello and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. This time I'm going to explain how the special stage in Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was created and the pretty clever method they used to achieve it. Firstly, let's tick off the simple stuff. They have a standard parallax layer which they can move around to give the illusion of a sky dome around the level. Sonic and Tails are animated sprites, as are the rings. The rings have multiple sizes stored in video RAM and they draw the correct size based on the distance they are away from the player. It looks like they have 6 sizes and 3 frames of animation to make them spin, so a total of 18 frames to draw the rings in any position. These frames are stored here in video RAM. The hazardous mines are also animated sprites, just like the rings, but only 4 sizes and no animation. The same goes for the Chaos Emeralds at the end. It looks like they use 8 sizes for the shadows, but as they can also move up the walls, an extra set is used for that, which can be mirrored to use on the other side. In fact, the shadows and the mine graphics look like they can be mirrored down the middle to halve memory if needed, at the cost of using more sprites to draw, as they would have to be drawn in two halves. And finally, the checkpoint gates are just reused ring graphics with palette swapping to make them flash. So far, so standard for this kind of thing, but the biggest draw of the level is clearly the 3D background track that you run around. However, the track obviously isn't real-time drawn in 3D, as the machine really doesn't have the power to do that, so instead it uses stored frames of animation. In terms of how many frames of animation are used, it looks like 4 frames repeated for running forward, 6 frames to go into a turn, 6 frames repeated to keep turning, 3 frames to end a turn, 17 frames to run down a hill, and 17 frames to run up a hill. Hills are always found during a corner and always end in a corner, and this is to keep all the possible layouts to a minimum. So it looks like a total of around 53 frames. Now, with a screen resolution of 320 by 224, 53 frames would take nearly 2 megabytes, which is twice the size of the Sonic 2 cartridge, so clearly some tricks were needed. First, they used a special lower resolution mode for this section, running at a screen resolution of 256 by 224. Secondly, the background animation is half the resolution of the rest of the screen, which quarters the memory needed for a frame of animation. And at first glance, it also seems like the animation is mirrored, which would then use half the memory again. But because the track turns around corners, it means the screen can't be mirrored. But also, clearly the screen is mirrored when you're running straight, so why have they done this? Well, being mirrored graphically means that if you have an animation for turning right, you can just mirror that animation to turn left, so they don't save memory per frame, but they do need less frames of animation in total. So bearing all this in mind, the lower resolution would mean one frame of animation would take around 7k, and so a total memory size of about 370k, but this is still way too much. So Sega employed a very interesting method to solve this problem. If we look at a dump of the video RAM being used during the level, we can see that the first chunk of it is filled with these strange coloured blocks. While at first this looks like just random noise, looking closer we can see that it's made of 8x8 blocks of vertical colours. All the background screens on the Sega Genesis are made up of a map consisting of 8x8 character blocks. The map tells the display which 8x8 blocks to show on screen, so these blocks are the smallest individual objects that can be easily displayed on screen. If we zoom in on one line of the special stage animation, we can see that it's made up of 2x2 pixels of different colours. If we take a group of 4 low res pixels like this, and stretch it down so it fills an 8x8 block, we can see that it looks very similar to the blocks in video RAM. So what Sega has done is to figure out every combination of 4 colours in a row that every animation uses, and they have stored a block like this for every combination of colours used. Then they stored a map of where every block goes to build up this image. Now obviously, with the block being 8 pixels deep, the picture would appear very stretched, but they can use horizontal interrupts to squash the picture back up again so it appears just 2 pixels deep. Then they do this for the whole screen, and you get the final image. The advantage of this is that they can store 4 pixels in just one block, and as there are a total of 372 combinations, they can tell the map which block to use in just 9 bits. So 9 bits can represent 4 pixels. Now, I'd imagine they also use a bit to say whether or not to flip the block horizontally, as this would give them many more combinations without adding any new blocks to video RAM. So let's say it costs them 10 bits for every 4 pixels. Let's see what a difference that makes to the memory used. So for the 128 pixel width, this is 32 groups of 4 pixels. So that's 32 by 10 bits, which is 40 bytes. Multiplying this by the 112 vertical pixels makes it a total of 4,480 bytes per frame, which would be around 230 
31K or less than a quarter of the cartridge space. Now, on top of this, Sega would have used some compression methods to further reduce this. In Video RAM, they are double buffering the animation, which means that they are uncompressing the next frame of the animation from the cartridge ROM while the current one is being displayed. The frame rate of the animation looks to be around 15 frames a second, so they have plenty of time to decompress the next frame. I'd imagine this could at least half the memory used, especially given how much repeated colour they have in the animation. Now, the downside to using this technique is that it really limits the number of colours used. They're using just seven colours here, plus a transparent colour so you can see the parallax layer. If they used more colours, the combinations of blocks they'd need would go up dramatically. They also don't have every combination of colours that they do use, which is another reason why the animation is so simple, with such large areas of block colour and no real shading. However, it is an ingenious trick and certainly saves cartridge space, even if they have to use a lot of video RAM for the block combinations and the two large double buffer screens. And because they can effectively plot four pixels using just one block, it's a very quick way of getting the pixels onto screen, much faster than having to draw each pixel individually. So although it has limitations in the colours you can use, the speed of drawing and the memory saving makes it more than worth it in this case. However, let me know in the comments if you think there is a better way they could have achieved this effect, and I'll see you in the next episode of Coding Secrets. Goodbye.